Okay, we are going to continue in our study of First and Second Corinthians uh, in our Address the Mess series. Now, I'm going to go through a brief recap as quickly as possible, but I want to get everybody as caught up as I can because we're going to uh, continue in chapter 14, and there's a lot that led up to this. So we are in First and Second Corinthians. As I said, this is the Address the Mess series. We titled it that because the Corinthian church was a mess. That's why we titled it that pretty simple. So much so that Paul really couldn't like, avoid it anymore. He had to write them a letter and start getting them back in line. Uh, he kind of had a closeness to this church because he spent 14 or 15 months with them helping them establish it four or five years before he wrote these letters. Uh, and, and during that time, I'm sure he got close to them, but he left when he felt like they were ready to be under their own leadership, but he left evidently too early because it, they strayed away from everything that he had taught them and they started becoming distracted and self-righteous and compromising uh, and they'd fallen so far that they were even abusing uh, their spiritual gifts. And... I mean, it was tough because what had happened really was they got tied in with uh, Greco-Roman culture, uh, which was around them, and so they started kind of picking up some of those habits and some of those beliefs, uh, and it just started destroying them. I mean, it started destroying them. They were becoming more like the Greco-Romans, which, you know, they all but worshipped. The Greco-Roman culture was godless and immoral, uh, and they all but worshipped intellectuals. That's what they looked to. They looked to uh, wisdom, knowledge, intellectuals. and those were like their celebrities. They loved the intellectual. They loved the philosopher. They loved the, you know, the brilliant orators or the politicians of that day. They loved those people. And so uh, they, they sought to be the person that gets that kind of respect and that kind of admiration. And it was kind of bleeding over into the church. And with some of the Corinthians started getting the same uh, kind of mindset. So this now four or five years later, he writes his letter trying to get them straightened out. Now, for the past several weeks, we've been discussing spiritual gifts and the use of them and also love. Uh, We discussed Paul's teaching on the importance of both. Love, obviously, is the ultimate gift, and everyone has it. Everyone who's believed has the gift of love. You just have to exercise it. Not everyone uses it, unfortunately, but everyone has it, and every gift that you are given comes from love. If it's going to be effective, it has to have its foundation uh, in love, but the Corinthians didn't really desire any gift. They wanted the gifts they thought made them look important. They wanted to be in leadership. They wanted to speak in tongues. They wanted to be an interpreter. They wanted to be you know, a prophet. They wanted the kind of position that would get people to look at them the way the Greco-Romans looked at the philosophers and the, and the brilliant orators of their day. So they actually had the wrong motives for wanting spiritual gifts in the first place. They just wanted to be looked at. They wanted to be ad- admired by people. So Paul just thought, you better get this letter written to them, because if not, they were going to self-destruct. And the way they were using tongues, he just felt like he had to clarify what the appropriate use of gifts, especially the gift of tongues, looks like. So I titled today's message, Order in the Church. Now we're done with that recap. Everybody caught up? Good, because I'm not starting over. All right. So let's jump right in. So last week we started discussing Paul's teachings on the gift of speaking in tongues. Everybody's telling me, oh, this is such a controversial chapter, I just don't understand that. I mean, I think it's pretty black and white, and I think if you take the time and study it, it it explains itself very well. Uh, And so it's a long chapter, but the reason that they are dealing with the gift of tongues is not because it's more special than any other gift. It's because it was the gift they were abusing. It was the gift that was most abused uh, as I told you earlier in, the, in la- last week's message, there, the pagan version of tongues had made its way into the Corinthian church. And the pagan version, ecstatic babble, uh, where someone would just stand up and blab and say gibberish and someone else would pretend to know what they were saying and interpret it, that had bled its way into the, the Christian church and it was starting to, uh, they were starting to pull the same thing during a service. Right? So Paul just wanted to get him straight on the gift of tongues. Now, he never said the gift of tongues was a bad thing. And he never criticized the gift of tongues. Let's make sure we were clear on that. All he did was clarify some misconceptions about how it was to be used. Okay, that was all he was doing here. First of all, the word tongues, and I've told you this, is from the Greek word glosson. It means language. It's, it just means a language. And it describes a language that is established, a language that's understandable and interpretable. It's not some spiritual babble that someone just stands up and babbles with. It's not Uh, anything kind of gibberish or anything like that. It means an actual language that is understood and that people know exists, right? Now, to prove that he didn't have any issue with the gift of tongues, Paul kind of reminds them, hey, I speak in tongues. Listen to this, starting in verse 18. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in church, I desire to speak five words with my mind, or understandable words, 
uh, so that I may instruct others also, rather than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue or in a tongue. Um, as we said last week, that's a 2,000 to 1 ratio that he would rather you not speak in an unknown tongue. 2,000 to 1. So Paul said, I have the gift of tongues also. I'm not bashing it, basically, is what he's saying. I have it. He said, I actually have it more than all of you. And historians have, like we said last week, he was talking about the fact that he speaks somewhere between four and 14 languages, depending on which biblical story you talk to. Uh, but he was very multilingual, and he used that in his ministry, traveling around to the Gentiles. Uh, he knew so many different languages, he could preach to a lot of people. So when he said, I speak in tongues more than all of you, it doesn't mean my babble's cooler than your babble. He was saying, I know more languages, and I can, I can put it into action in my ministry more than most. But he knew that the gift of tongues was just that. It's a gift. And God gives believers gifts for one reason. We have gifts to glorify and serve him. That's why he gives us gifts. The only reason he gives us gifts. And sometimes I think we forget that. Our gifts are not to make us look special or make us look spiritual. Our gifts are to illuminate God in the eyes of people that we come in contact with. See, Paul went even a little step farther reminding him that if you're going to do tongues, it, it should be, it's a gift made to uplift God, to serve God with, and it should edify the church. And this is, this is really the litmus test. Whenever you're in a church, if someone's doing something that doesn't edify the church, it's probably sin. Has anybody ever been to a church service and the wheels came off? Anybody? Just a few of you? Oh, we need to take a field trip. I'm just telling you. But I'm, I, I was in a service one time, and it, it went absolutely off the rails on me. kind of freaked me out. So I took a couple seminary students, I think they're sophomores in seminary, on a field trip, which is to this date still one of the funnest days of my life. But we get in there, and I knew the pastor. You don't have to agree with somebody to love them. And I, me and the pastor are good friends, loved him, but he was very charismatic. We used to call him Plenty Costal because, I mean, he was sold out charismatic. Loved that guy. So we get in there, and the music starts playing, and they're, they're thinking, well, it's no big deal. Then it started getting louder and louder. I don't know who was running the soundboard, but they were going for straight up Bon Jovi back there. And then it started getting louder and louder, and then as it got louder, they started getting more rowdy, right? Next thing you know, the lady who's singing kicks her, I'm not, didn't take her shoes off. She kicked them off, and with deadly accuracy, landed them right by each other, and Everybody started dancing and running around and flopping. And on the, it was nuts. I mean, and you could see, I looked over, and their eyes, they were going. They were horrified, and I was laughing. And so everybody started clapping. Now, I've been there enough to know when they clap, by God, you better clap. Okay? It's not like it was really an option. So as soon as they start clapping, I'm like, I'm in. And I'm clapping. Well, the pastor, and I think he was messing with them too, but he saw them over there, and he walks up and grabs their hands like this and makes them clap. <laughs> and that kid looked like somebody stabbed him. I was laughing so hard. I probably shouldn't have been. Nah, it was just funny. But anyway, um, if you've ever been in a service where the rails just come off, you'll see what I mean. It just doesn't feel right if it's not edifying God. If God isn't edified, if the church isn't edified, it feels wrong in the service. Now listen to this, 1 Corinthians 14, 11. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks as a what? A barbarian, and to, the, and to the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Not you, the church, right? Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret, okay? So mature Christians understand what Paul's saying. Mature believers believe with all their heart, right, that they have their gift to serve God. They know it's not about them. As a matter of fact, they don't want the attention to be on them. Their gift was given to them to serve God and to, uh, and to edify Him and edify the church. That's what mature believers understand. That's the whole designation of that gift. Paul talked about that in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 31. He said, So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all what? For the glory of God. Here's the best litmus test for you. If you think you have a gift, ask yourself, am I doing it so people will look at me or am I doing it so people will look at God? Okay, ask yourself that. Verse 32, don't give offense to the Jews or Gentiles or the church of God. Uh, I too try to please 
everyone in everything I do. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others so that many may be saved. He wasn't saying that he tried to please everybody by doing what they wanted. He was saying that his goal was to please everybody by teaching them the gospel that they could understand and believe in. See, using tongues or any gift. Remember, I'm not just picking on tongues here. And FYI, I didn't write the chapter. Okay, I'm just teaching it. But um, I'm not just picking on tongues. Any gift should never be used to glorify oneself. And if it is used to glorify oneself, it's just a sure sign that that person is very, very spiritually immature. So in verse 20, I mean, Paul's basically telling his readers, hey, it is time to grow up. You guys are so worried about people looking at you. You're so worried about getting glory and credit. Would you just grow up? That's what he's telling them. And I love, Paul was the person who had the ability to, in an eloquent fashion, tell you that you were being a big, fat baby, you know? And he just had the ability. He was a great politician. And when it came to, he could insult you <laughs> eloquently. So you're like, thank you, I think. You know what I mean? That's what Paul was. Listen to this, verse 20. He said, brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Underscore children if you're following along. Yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Now the word children here in the Greek is pedion, right? And it means prepubescent child. So when he was calling him a kid, it wasn't even a teenager. He was saying, stop being immature little kids, is what he was saying to him. The Greek word actually implies, they would use this word to describe children playing loudly in the marketplace. That's how this word would be used, children playing loudly in the marketplace. And this wasn't the first time Paul called him out about spiritual immaturity. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 1. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. So first he calls them an infant. At least they've grown up now to where they're prepubescent in this insult, right? Uh, verse 2, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even, uh, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? So this isn't the first time he told them you need to grow up. But using spiritual gifts the way they were using was just proving they were immature. They wanted to be looked at. It was like a little child shouting out, look what I can do. Remember when you were a kid and you always wanted your mom or dad's attention? Anybody remember that? How many people, I know I'm not the only one. I know it. How many people ever said, look, mom, I can ride with no hands? How many people bit it after that? Good. Thank you, Lord. Misery loves company. I mean, I went down. When I wrecked, I did it right. I mean, skinned face. I skipped across the concrete, you know. Hey, watch what I'm doing, Dad. You know what I mean? That's kind of what they're doing here. They were like little children saying, look at my spiritual gift. Look at my spiritual gift. I speak in tongues. I'm an interpreter. I'm more spiritual than you. But the mature believer doesn't say, look at what I can do. The mature believer says, look to God and watch what he can do. Trust in God and let him show you what he can do. That's what mature believers do, and he was trying to get them to see that. Now, this is pretty cool. Paul actually is going to quote Isaiah 28 here to kind of make a comparison between the immaturity and the, and the resistance of the Jews in Isaiah's time and the immaturity and resistance of the Jews in uh, the, Paul's time. 1 Corinthians 14, 21. It says, In the law it is written, By men of strange tongues and by lips of strangers I will speak to this people. Now notice that. He said, I will speak to this people through what? Men of strange tongues. Okay, strangers. All right. And even so, they will not what? They will still not listen to me, says the Lord. So he compared the Corinthian spiritual maturity to the spiritual maturity that Isaiah was speaking of. And here's what Isaiah was speaking of there. Isaiah had been prophesying that you guys need to turn this around. You need to turn back to God. Because if you don't, the Assyrian army is going to attack us. It's imminent. And they're going to destroy us and lay us waste. But if you'll turn back now, God will spare us. So just turn back. And they blew him off. And he kept saying, listen, I'm telling you, I'm not guessing. It's going to happen. If you don't turn around, he is going to destroy us. And they wouldn't listen. And they wouldn't listen and wouldn't listen. He was trying to speak to them through the prophet. But they ignored him. And they ignored his prophets. So here's the thing with God. God's not like the person you ignore him enough, they go away. God doesn't do that. God loves you. And especially if you're a believer, he's not going away. He is going to keep after you until you see it his way. 
So he's like, okay, great. So you don't want to listen to my prophets. You don't want to listen to me. So maybe you'll listen to this foreign invading force. And they came in and just laid that place waste. In that invasion, they literally uh, took Israel as captives and slew a bunch of them, and they end up being in slavery. And through that invading army, God spoke to Israel. Now they would listen. Now they were saying, this is the judgment for our behavior that has been promised to us that we've been ignoring. God spoke to them through men of strange tongues, this invading army. It was, they realized that was just a fulfillment of the prophecy they ignored. Well, the comparison here is that Paul, when he wrote this, there were a lot of unbelieving Jews in the first Corinthian church, in the first Corinthian, in the Corinthian church. Uh, and there were a lot of, of them in Corinth in general. And the unbelieving Jews of Paul's time might have been worse than the ones in Isaiah's time. Because think about this, the one in Isaiah's time, you know, they saw some miraculous things throughout the history of their, you know, up to that point, right? But, and they should have believed, they should have believed Isaiah, I'm not saying that. But these Jews had watched Jesus walk on water, heal the sick, feed thousands, thousands with a few pieces of bread and a few fish. When you read the section where it says it was 5,000, that's just the men, if you add the women and children, and they're probably feeding like 20,000. We'll bring that up again here in a minute. But, I mean, it was a, they saw these miracles. They saw him raise the dead. They saw the empty tomb, right? He walked on water and told the storm to stop. Remember we talked about that last week? Production, boy, right? That's what he did. So they saw all this, and yet they rejected him? Paul's like, you're just like him. Maybe even worse, the author of Hebrews, listen to what he says about their rejection, Hebrews 2, 3. He says, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, that's talking about the apostles, God also testifying with them by signs and wonders, that's the miracles, and by various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Okay, so I love how that's describing it. Because that's exactly what they were like. The unbelieving Jews of Paul's time would end up having to get communicated with the same way the ones in, uh, in Isaiah's time did. But here's what happened. Isaiah's time, they were taken over by the Assyrians. Now he said, now you'll listen to me, although it'll be speaking through the Assyrian army. In Paul's time, about maybe a couple decades later, they were going to be invaded by a foreign force. They were going to be taken captive by a foreign force. They were going to learn by the mouth of strangers. Because in 70 AD, the Roman general Titus now would invade Israel and just lay it waste. And they would kill, I don't know how many, and, and the ones that weren't killed were taken into captivity. They even tore down the temples and mocked them and did terrible things to, to belittle their temple and to, and to do things that, that were just blasphemy in the temple. And they were completely laid waste. And this was God saying, just like the time of Isaiah, you wouldn't hear me, now you'll hear me. You turned away my son. Now you'll hear me because you'll hear me through this invading army. Okay? Now, let me see what my time is. Whew. Am I talking too fast? You want me to slow down? I can't. <laughs> I honestly cannot. All right. So anyway, so the gift of tongues, basically what this is leading up to was the gift of tongues was a sign to unbelieving Jews of Paul's time. It was a sign of unbelieving Jews of Paul's time. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. It said, though, uh, So then tongues are a, for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is a sign, not to unbelievers, but those who believe. Okay, I'm going to read about the day of Pentecost. It's long. It's 13 verses. How many people have heard of the day of Pentecost? Raise your hands. Okay. A lot of times misused, but... This is a beautiful time in, in, in history that really turned a lot of people to God. Unbelievers saw these signs and knew God was real. Listen to this, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Still the same Greek word, glossa, right? Uh, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, capital S, was giving them utterance, right? Verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. 
And when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and, we be, and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own, in his own language. Now, was he hearing them speak in Babel? No, in his own language. All right. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are, uh, saying, why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Uh, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Perga and, and Pamphylia and Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Whew, we get it. There was a lot of people, Paul. We get it, right? Uh, Cretans and Arabs. <laughs> we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and in great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking them, saying they are full of sweet wine. Okay, so here's two pretty uneducated guys getting up to speak. They're speaking in Galilean, right, which a lot of people looked at that as hillbilly, right? So they're getting up speaking in Galilean, and when they speak, everybody in that crowd, and I'm not going over that list again, bunch of people, okay, different places, they all heard him speaking in their language. Now, he wasn't looking at each one and speaking in their language. He was speaking in Galilean. This is the gift of tongues. This is the gift of tongues. They would speak in their language, and God would interpret it to the one listening in their language. So when people ask me, you think that could still happen today? Absolutely. And I'll explain that more uh, as we move on. But the unbelieving Jews and the Gentiles, even Gentiles at Pentecost, heard the miracle of tongues, and as a result, they believed. Because tongues and spiritual gifts are signs to the unbelieving. They prove that God is real. And on that day, there were 5,000 men that believed. Again, that's men. right? There was, hey, back then, they talked about men. But get this. Most of them were married. So if they were all married, that'd make it 10,000, Right? And back then, they didn't have 2.3 kids per family. They had like 8.2 kids per family because they needed field hands. Let's just be honest, right? So it probably was more like between 25 and 40,000 people believed that day because of the sign of God's power to the unbeliever through the gift of tongues. Not babbling through the gift of tongues. They all heard in their own language. So that's why... The, the gift of tongues was a gift uh, was, uh, for the unbelieving. But prophecy, on the other hand, was assigned to those who believe. Now remember, prophecy just means inspired utterances. We have mystified that way too much. Okay, it just means inspired utterances or a message to believers from God. When I'm doing this, I'm prophesying. When you are in Bible study talking about the Word of God, you are prophesying. When you're reading a devotional, you are reading prophecy. Okay, that is prophesying. Divine utterance is or inspired utterances are prophecy. And obviously, you know, I'm not limiting their audience. There's always, you know, prophecy can reach unbelievers and tongues can reach believers. That, but as a rule, the Word of God is for believers. Do you realize in 66 books, how many books do you think there are that talk about believing? One. That doesn't mean it's not mentioned throughout the New Testament. It's not mentioned. That's not what I'm saying. A book dedicated to belief is John. And people have asked me before, why do you think that is? I go, I don't know, maybe because God made it simple and he didn't think we'd be so stupid as to complicate it like we have. You know what I mean? He's like, all you got to do is believe that what my son did was enough to guarantee your eternal life and I will give it to you. I don't care what you've done. Everybody's a sinner. We've complicated it from that to you have to be baptized, you have to be confirmed, you have to take this class, you have to do this, you have to give this much. And God's going, how did you mess that up? One book tells you everything. What's wrong with you people? You know what I mean? One book. And the reason is, is most of the book, the other 66 books, teach us history of the church, and they also teach believers how to walk closer to God. Listen, you can't walk closer to God without the Word of God. You have to have the Word of God. If you're an, I don't like it when you see people who don't believe or atheists trying to explain things in the Bible, because most of it is spiritually discerned, right? It means God is revealing it to you through the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're an unbeliever, and you're reading anything other than John, you're reading somebody else's mail, okay? 
because he wrote that to believers to, to edify those believers, right? So that's why he was saying that. It's, you know, obviously I'm not limiting it, but that's mainly what it's for, to bring people closer to him. Okay, now one thing for sure, neither tongues nor prophecy was created to glorify humanity. That's for sure. It was never designed to glorify humanity. Also, if the use of tongues or prophecy causes chaos or confusion in a church uh, or any kind of service, it is not from God. You should not leave church going, what the heck just happened there? If you've ever left like that, I mean, you walk out the door going, okay, I am never coming back to that. When I was first searching for churches, I didn't tell early services, but y'all special. I was, um, I remember I was, <laughs> it was kind of strange because I, I mean, I went to this service fully wanting to find God. And the music service was just nuts. I mean, anybody who wanted to got up and sang, and, and I say that lightly because some of them just could not sing. And it was so bad that when they were singing, I looked at the person beside me, I thought it was a joke. God help me, I hope they didn't know I felt that way. And I remember when I left there going, I didn't even, couldn't even enjoy the message, it was so bad, and everybody was you know, getting a little crazy. And when I left there, I remember thinking, nope, I think I'm done with church for a while. You shouldn't leave a church feeling that way. If, it, if you're confused or if it's bringing confusion or chaos, it is not from God. It's not from God. And so anything that you do to make this service in any church or any type of learning situation where you make it chaotic and confusing, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a sin because you're, you're making it impossible for people to hear the message. Okay, now he'll look more at that as we go throughout the rest of this. I am keeping an eye on the clock. Okay, so next Paul appeals to their logic. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. He says, Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbeliever enter, will they not say that you are mad? That means, won't they think you're nuts? Won't they think you're crazy? Right? But if all people, I mean, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all and he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart, listen, are disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, uh, declaring that God is certainly among you. Now, here's the thing that's different. Most people think that Paul was being snarky here, right? Like he was being a smart aleck. Like he was going, geez, everybody's going to think you're stupid. That's not what Paul was saying. He wasn't being snarky at all. Remember, they loved lo logic and, and, and the intellectual. They loved that. So he thought, okay, you love logic. Let me, let me appeal to that logic, right? Let me give you a scenario that might appeal to your logic. He's using that love they have for the intellectual against them, right? So he was saying in the Chris Mosley version, think about it. If everyone gathers for a service and everyone wants to speak in tongues without any order, it will appear to visitors that you're nuts. That's what he was saying to him. He's like, think about it. Put yourself in their shoes. Anybody ever tell you that? Put yourself in their shoes? Listen, he's saying, imagine you're the guy that walks in and 10 different languages are being spoken simultaneously and nobody's telling you what they mean. What are you going to think? This is how he applied or was appealing to their knowledge. So I'm telling you, if you've been in that situation, you know exactly what he's talking about. And if you add in the fact that nobody's interpreting and everybody's babbling in a tongue, it's even twice as confusing because nobody's telling you what anybody's saying. It'd be just like walking into an insane asylum. That's what it would feel like. People just babbling and nobody understand what's going on. Kind of like, you know, the po politics in their national conventions. And I'll tell you what, if you've ever been around it where everybody's talking, everybody's doing everything at the same time in the church, it kind of sounds mumbly and creepy. Kind of cultish, to be honest with you. I heard that, you know, people mumbling in all different tongues and doing this stuff, and I was thinking to myself, if they bust out a goat and an altar, I am out of here. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't saved, so I just got the heck out of Dodge is what I did, and that's what most people do. And he's saying, you need to empathize with those people. Think about it. Think what they would feel like. But if an unbeliever walks in, a new person, and, and everyone is, is, doing, is prophesying and is done in order, they're sharing God's divine utterances, then that prophecy will bring the believers closer to God, and it will convict the hearts of the unbelievers, and it might persuade them to believe. The word convicted in the Greek is a line keho, and this is very important because it means to point out someone's guilt, but with proof they're guilty. That's what it means when it says convicted. Okay, and Jesus used the same word in John 16. Look at John 16, 7. It says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, capital H, talking about the Holy Spirit, 
will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, capital H, to you. And he, when he comes, will convict. convict. Everybody's going, will what? (laughs) No. (laughs) He will convict the world concerning what? Sin Sin and righteousness and? and judgment. So it's the Holy Spirit's job to interpret the word of God to our hearts. But before we believe, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of our sin and not just accuse us. Remember, that word means accusing with proof. The Holy Spirit says, stop. Let me show you who you are without God. Everybody remember when that time came in your life? I remember sitting in a pew, and I'm going to try not to ball here, but I remember sitting in a pew, and everything that man was saying, I swear I thought he was talking to me. Has that ever happened to anybody? I've had people get mad at me and say, that was about me. I'm like, no offense, but I don't think that much of you. I'm not going to make a sermon for you. All right, but I mean literally everything the man said. He's talking about the prodigal son. I didn't know anything about the Bible, nothing. I knew it was a big and had a lot of begats in it. That's all I knew, all right? And I remember he was talking about stuff I didn't get, and when he brings up the prodigal son, if you know the story of the prodigal son, he goes out and gets wild and loses everything. I thought, oh my gosh, that's my story. I'm him, you know what I mean? I didn't know about the Hebrew children in the fire. I didn't know what that meant, but I cried. People are looking at me like I'm nuts. They're singing about the Hebrew children in the fire. They, they were delivered. I'm like, I know. I, don't, I, just don't. I was just bawling. Why? Because God was showing me through the Holy Spirit with evidence. You're guilty, Chris. Look what's become of your life apart from me. Look what hope you have without me. You want to have peace, you're never going to find it in a bottle. You're never going to find it in a pill or in a line that you chop up. You're never going to find it in a needle. You are never going to find anything that will give you satisfaction until you find my son. That's what was speaking to me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He speaks to you and proves to you who you are. You might deny it if your dad tells you. You might deny it if your mom tells you. Your best friend tells you. You might say, you're nuts. That's not me. But when the Holy Spirit comes with proof and says, I created you. I see everything you do, and I'm telling you, you are not happy. You're not happy, and you won't be until Jesus becomes number one in your life. So the Holy Spirit, he knows our dirty secrets that we try to hide, and he pulls them out. You know those secrets that nobody knows? And all you guys look at me like, I don't have them. Well, one of your secrets is you lie. (laughs) Because everybody has them. Everybody has secrets. And when the Holy Spirit whispers in your ear, just in case you're wondering if this is legit, remember what you did in seventh grade? I'm like, okay, 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 I got you. You know, he points it out to you, right? Uh, And that's what happens uh, with prophecy. Now, verse, let me see if I have time here. Yep, I got time. Okay, Uh, verse 26, let's jump in this. He starts talking about true order. It says, what is the outcome then, brethren, when you assemble, each one has a psalm, each one has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for what? Edification. Edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two. Listen, underscore this, highlight it. I mean, whatever you do, little stars, asterisks around it, okay? It should be by two or at the most three. And each in turn... And one must interpret. Okay? There's a reason I read that so slow. Uh, But if there is no interpreter, he must shut up. No, I mean, he must keep silent. He must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak. Same thing. And let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. So he's talking about order in church. And Paul used this hypothetical situation they just happened to be talking about everything that was going on in their church uh, and it, it, to like, teach the importance of order in a service. He basically said, Chris Mosley version, when you assemble, everyone can't try to exercise their spiritual gifts at once. There has to be order. This is what he was telling them. Everyone can't do it at once. There has to be order. Let me explain something you may not realize. In Paul's time, they had made a train wreck of their church. It was a train wreck. I mean, I am not kidding you. The worship service was nuts because, see, they allowed anyone who had a prophecy, a song, anything to just stand up. And some people didn't want to wait for the other one to be quiet, so they'd stand up. And someone else might see those two talking and say, well, they're stupid. Mine's better. And they stood up. 
And before long, it sounded like an auction house. It was nuts, right? And so it was literally getting so far out of hand because everybody was trying to compete with their spiritual gifts so everybody would see them. They wanted to be looked at as the cool one. So it ended up being utter chaos, people jumping up out of order. It was absolutely nuts. Then Paul says, hold on a second. Listen, let all things be done for edification. Edification is the Greek word okodomeia. It means to strengthen or to build up. Let everything be done to strengthen or build up people in the church, right? Paul wanted the Corinthians to make sure their worship was effective, and everybody babbling at the same time is not very effective. And by effective, I mean he wanted to make sure that, that whatever they were doing spiritually strengthened and built people up in that church. If it didn't, it's not from God. It's that simple. It's not from God. Now, all the gifts he mentioned in verse 26, he used to accomplish to edify a service. None of them exist to make you look good. That gift does not exist. God never gave us a gift so people go, wow, you're awesome. And I'll tell you, there's some people who've forgotten that, especially in ministry. Trust me on that one. They're more in love with themselves than anybody. They don't need a congregation. You know, but the truth is, if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're just a mouthpiece. God can use anybody. Sometimes when I have writer's block and I'm working on a sermon, I will say, Lord, I know you used a donkey in the Old Testament. Certainly you can use me. You know what I mean? And that's what we need to remember is that he can use anyone, but none of the gifts he's going to give you is to build you up. That's not what they exist for. The Corinthians just allowed their church to become a free-for-all, and it was because everybody desired to be seen and heard and look spiritual. And so Paul said, here's what you got to do. There are ways that you can exercise your gifts without making confusion. So he says, when you assemble, that means in a service, there are certain guidelines that apply. If you go to churches that practice this, most of them do not follow these guidelines. No, most of them don't, and I'm not dissing them, they just don't, right? So here's the guidelines, right? Uh, if someone has a psalm, that just means that's a Greek word, psalmos, it means song of praise. Uh, they're supposed to do it in order, orderly fashion and one at a time. The same is true with teaching, sharing revelation, and the tongues, interpretation. If you're going to speak in tongues, other languages, you've got to have an interpreter, someone who can tell everybody, or it's worthless, right? And you can't have more than three, two to three. If you have more than two or three speak in that service, you're not doing it correctly, right? Two to three. If you have people prophesying, there's not supposed to be more than two or three prophesying. And if you have somebody that has songs, no one is supposed to be singing over each other. He's saying, let two or three prophesy or speak in a tongue with an interpreter and let the others pass judgment. That's most likely talking about the elders uh, because pass judgment is the Greek word diakrino and it means to evaluate. So he's saying, uh, you prophesy and let them evaluate you. Okay, this is probably the process of bringing up uh, young ministers, I would assume. That's why Paul said what he said really bluntly in verses 31 through 33. He said, for you can all prophesy what? One by one. There's no chaos here. So that all may learn and be exhorted. And the spirit, now notice this, really cautious. The spirits, small s, okay, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That's very important. Here, listen to this. Underscore this, highlight it, you know, put it on a banner, tattoo it on you. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So evidently what was happening was Paul was saying, you guys need to get this under control. And some people were saying, I just can't stop myself. When the Spirit gets a hold of me, I just can't stop myself, right? And so I just got to get up and babble like it's, you know, everybody cares, <laughs> you know? And he's saying, that, he's saying that's wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Because the spirit of the prophets, when it was small, the spirits, what that meant was the gifted are not controlled by the gift. The gifted control the gift with the guidance of God. That's what he was saying. He's saying you absolutely can help it. God will not give you something that creates confusion and makes everybody leave with chaos in their head. God will not do that. He's not going to make you jump up and do something stupid. That's another spirit. You better check it, see which one it is. There was a lady, no joke, I'm not making this up, you can't write it this good, okay? There was a lady one time, that they were all, or a guy rather, they're all, everything was going nuts. This guy jumps up and he says, God's telling me to run my head in that wall. No joke. So he takes off, boom, ran his head into the wall. He shakes his head and he got up and he said, God told me not to do that again. 
I wish that were a joke. That really happened. That really, really happened. I know. It's absolute nuts. <laughs> One time I was, when I, before I was saved, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I'm going to. One time before I was saved, I was, in a, I was in a service, and this is awful, but I'd stopped in there because I was going to go drinking with the bass player in the choir. I know. I wasn't saved at the time. So God forgave me. You have to, too. All right? <laughs> so I'm waiting on him. And, you know, actually, they were pretty good musicians. And they were playing music, and I'm just, you know, I wasn't raised with that style of worship, so I didn't know what was going on. And so everybody said, let's have a time of fellowship. To me, that means everybody shakes hands. How you doing? Right? You know, maybe a hug here and there. <laughs> they all held hands in a circle around the inside of the church, and there were only two people left sitting in the pews, me and that guy's girlfriend. That's it. Like two little birds in a nest, right? All of them were around us. And so the music started getting fast. Well, I don't know what it is with fast music. I don't get it. But it started getting really fast, and everybody started running in circles, holding hands around the inside. And I'm going, what are they doing? And she goes, it'll stop in a minute. <laughs> I go, I want it to stop now. So it, it stopped, and then everybody started dancing. There was a guy who could jump up and run on the backs of the pews without falling. They're actually pretty athletic. Um, uh, and every, everything was going nuts around me, and I thought, I can take it. Then this lady, a little old lady, comes dancing back to me, dancing back to me, Okay and grabs me by the arm. And you know how people say the fear of God come over you? I think that's what that was. Because every pore was shooting adrenaline. I was so spooked. And I'm like, what are you doing? I remember, this is unsaved, Chris, so I won't tell you my exact words. Okay? I said, what are you doing? She said, it's your time. I said, my time for what? She said, it's your time. I'm like, seriously, lady, my time for what? She goes, it's your time to get saved? I go, no, it isn't. She goes, yeah, it is, and started pulling me. And I'm like, I swear it's not my time. She said, it's your time. And finally, I looked at her, and I said, you better let go of me. It is not my time. Then she decided God told her something wrong, and she let go of me. <laughs> I might have used some different descriptive terms also. Scared me to death. That is not from God, and you can control it. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets. God, the gifted one, is in control of their gifts with the help of God. That's what that's talking about, right? Now, I better move on. So Paul, you know what? I'm not even going to have time. So I'm going to go back up for one more thing I want to cover. And it says God is not the author of confusion. It's not just talking about a service. God wants you to know his word. Do you know that? So when people try to make the word of God a mystery... Or they try to sell you special books that will tell you the code to understand the Bible. Or they tell you you have to have this certain class or you won't understand the Bible. Listen, God wants you to clearly understand his word. James tells us if we want to, we ask for it. Okay, But whenever someone, if you're at a church, if you're at a Christian organization and they say that's not meant for you to understand, run. Run. Because when the word of God is made into a mystery or confusion, that is not from God. It is designed to be understood. It is designed to be understood. It will come to you in your time, but you are supposed to know what that means, okay? He doesn't author confusion. He doesn't author mysteries. He brings love and peace and salvation to anyone who wants it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, we'll have to pick up there next week. I'm going to ask you, would you please bow your heads? If this is your first time, we always like to give an invitation. Very briefly, we're not going to ask you to come up front or anything like that. We just want to pray for you. So while every head is bowed, if you're not sure where you stand or you just want me praying for you for whatever the reason, just make eye contact with me or raise your hand and put your head back down. Bless those people. Bless those people. Bless those people. I'm not going to chase you down. Bless those people. I really do pray for those faces. Bless those people. Bless those people. Bless those people. Listen, I take time to pray for you and I will. Bless those people. I promise. For those of us who are believers, or if you're listening online, God knows your heart, I got you too. But for believers, when I read stuff like this, I think, you know, our day when we get to go home is probably right around the corner. So while we're here, let's make the most of it. While we're here, find your gift. You have one. Find your gift and pray that God shows you how to use it and where to use it and when to use it. And he will because he gave it to you because he wants you to use it. And when you do, he'll work through you in ways you can't even understand. Let's pray. 
God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I thank you for your mercy and your kindness and your love and especially your grace. I could never deserve your salvation. I know that. I'm not good enough now. I don't deserve it now. I sin every day. It's only by the love of Jesus that I have eternal life. He came, died, and rose again, sinless, to pay for the sin of the world, knowing that we would never be good enough. He didn't die for us because we reached a certain level. He died for us right where we were, and he makes the changes as he needs to. God, give us the passion to surrender to him. God, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, I just pray that they believe that what he did was enough and you promised you'd give it to him. I want everything that confuses them out of their mind because that's not from you. If they make that decision, I pray they contact us and God, all of us who believe, set us on fire for you. Let our passion burn in us so that we might desire to share your word with others, so that we might dig deeply into your word and grow closer to you because we feel the time is short. Use us powerfully so that when people hear us and see us, they hear and see you. We just pray, God, as we leave here, you'd keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, we just pray we'd come together one more time and give you all the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of. We ask these things in Jesus' name.